Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We're just going to give it a couple more seconds while uh, people join us. We're coming to you live through Zoom and also uh, through the Sydney Southeast Asia Centre's Facebook page. So we'll give it a couple more seconds while um, the rest of our participants um, are let into the room. Okay, I can see the room starting to fill up, which is really terrific. <clears throat> we will get started. Um, so I'd like to welcome you all. I'm Dr. Natalie Pearson from the Sydney Southeast Asia Centre. And I'd like to welcome you tonight to the fourth and final in our Heritage and the Arts webinar series. It's been a really fantastic series. We've had some great speakers and we're finishing it off with um, another fantastic speaker tonight. So before we get started, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge that um, we are meeting uh, tonight on Gadigal country and I'd like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and future who have cared for these lands and waters and who continue to care for these lands and waters. And if you have a moment, I'd invite you to pop in the Q&A um, where you're joining us from tonight or at least to reflect on it um, where you are. So as I mentioned, we are joined by uh, Dr. Alex Birchmore tonight. Uh, and Dr. Alex Birchmore is a lecturer in the Museum and Heritage Studies program at the University of Sydney. He's uh, recently joined the university from the ANU, and he's going to be speaking to us tonight about the power and the privilege of blue and white in 14th century Vietnam and the Malay Peninsula. So Alex has got a new book coming out. Congratulations, Alex. I'd just like to mention that before we get underway. It's going to be published by the University of California Press, and the title is New Export China, Translations Across Time and Place in Contemporary Chinese Porcelain Art. So if you've been watching any of the webinars in the last 24 hours or so, you'll know that it's been a bit of a ceramic Indian Ocean trade festival at the University of Sydney. And uh, we had uh, John Guy from the Metropolitan Museum of Art last night. We had Shugata Ray this morning talking about um, turkeys across the Indian Ocean. And uh, we had another wonderful talk in the Department of Art History, looking at Indian Ocean trade and the um, uh, uh, coconuts. Um, so this is really the fourth and final of a wonderful 24 hours at the University of Sydney, looking at um, trade across the Indian Ocean and into Southeast Asia. And I think what Alex brings tonight is um, in particular China expertise, looking at China in Southeast Asia. So the format will be, um, Alex is going to speak to us for about 30 minutes, and then I will facilitate the Q&A session afterwards. Uh, if you do have questions and answers, please pop them in the chat, at, uh, in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Um, but without any further ado, Alex, I will hand over to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Natalie. And thank you to the Sydney Southeast Asia Centre for inviting me to talk tonight. I'll just... Okay, I'll just second that by um, saying that I'd like to, I'm, I'm speaking from Canberra, so I'd like to pay my deep respects and acknowledgements to the Nyanawal people in the ACT, on whose land sovereignty never ceded, I live and work. And I'd also like to pay my respects to the Gadigal people of the Yara Nation, on whose lands the University of Sydney now stands, sovereignty never ceded, as well as to all First Nations people on whose sovereign lands I am privileged to live and work both in Australia and overseas. So thinking about the title of this talk, when I was asked to choose a title for this, I settled on the power and privilege of blue and white in the hope that it would draw attention to some of the assumptions with which Chinese ceramics in Southeast Asia have long been associated. And John Guy, for those who attended the ST Lee lecture last night, spoke also about some of those assumptions. One of the most persistent of these is the belief that the greatest reverence for such ceramics and their most receptive market has historically taken shape within indigenous communities. The late art historian, conservationist, archaeologist, and anthropologist Barbara Harrison provided a textbook case of the image that such communities have customarily conjured for outside observers in 2003 in one of her last published reflections on this theme. She writes, to the sailor in foreign lands, ports were like islands of security separated from each other by stretches of dangerous waters. Beyond these ports, local people were fiercely independent. They wore bark and woven cloth and bronze, shell and gold. They filed their teeth and decorated them with inlay. Caution was needed in approaching these people. If shipwrecked, one might be slaughtered or else enslaved. 
During the 13th and 14th centuries, Harrison wrote, these communities were ruled by regional chiefs who advertised their power through their privilege to acquire precious or rare commodities, including trade goods like Chinese porcelain. Unfamiliar with the source of these goods and the methods of their manufacture, Harrison writes that the indigenous inhabitants of the Philippines and Indonesia were captivated. Several years before this in 1998, Robert Finley argued that porcelain destroyed the ceramic traditions of the archipelago with its ethereal qualities and enigmatic designs, becoming not merely a functional commodity, but a talismanic substance regarded in exalted terms and imbued with cosmological power. Like Harrison, he notes the role that porcelain played in the Philippines and Indonesia in particular as a medium for the expression of alliances, for the transition to ancestral realms, the healing of dire spiritual sicknesses, the revelation of prophecy, and the communion between human and other spheres of existence. He contrasts this with the acquisition of the same ceramics in Europe and the Middle East, where he writes porcelain remained marginal to religion and was employed only as an occasional decorative material apparently unaccompanied by connotations of supernatural power. More recently, expanding on these ideas in his ambitious book, The Pilgrim Art, Cultures of Porcelain and World History, Finley not only repeated his earlier summary of the primarily atavistic role played by this material in Southeast Asia, but also raised another assumption that I'd like to address in this paper. And in short, this is the assertion that Southeast Asian buyers of Chinese ceramics only enjoyed access to lower quality wares, for which there was nevertheless an insatiable demand driven by an alleged lack of technical and aesthetic sophistication. This is the assumption to which John Guy also drew attention last night when he noted our tendency to assume that ceramics circulating in Southeast Asia were of pedestrian quality, even though this was certainly not the case. Robert Finley writes, the archipelago responded unfailingly to the rhythms of Chinese seaborne commerce as China's undeveloped but resource rich hinterland, a cheap, easily accessible source of forest products and a sprawling marketplace for manufactured goods. It was China's favorite dumping ground, he writes, for its coarsest products. While Finley does concede that the residents of port cities, highly sophisticated by European and Middle Eastern standards, also purchased Chinese porcelain. He argues that the harbor masters, administrative officials, and urban businessmen of the entrepôt accumulated these products primarily as a commercial resource to be traded with peoples who were unfamiliar with structured governments and complex economies. Little more than a bankable cultural asset, a species of social currency and a sumptuary distinction. But against this customary definition of Chinese ceramics in Southeast Asia, as politically potent yet aesthetically inferior manufactured commodities, I would like to propose a parallel model for their circulation within this region by attempting to reconstruct some of the contexts for their use that have been lost to the passage of time or dispersed, as John Guy also noted, by the turmoils of history. So I've got a picture of Robert Finley's book here next to a, a more recent book by Anne Gerritsen. In the Pilgrim Art, which Anne Gerritsen has credited quite rightly with reviving scholarly interest in porcelain, Finley defines this material in deeply evocative terms as the most universally admired and the most widely imitated product in the world for over a thousand years. A prime vehicle for the assimilation and transmission of artistic symbols, themes and designs across vast distances and a sensitive barometer of human affairs. Porcelain is most revealing, he writes, when treated as a cultural cynosure, where art and commerce converge, drawn together by an artifact that articulates the beliefs, customs, and mentalities of those who make, purchase, and esteem it. Positioned at the intersection of everyday life, commerce, and art, porcelain affords a distinctive standpoint from which to view world history. Alongside the assumptions that I've already noted, however, the Pilgrim Art also resuscitated several other enduring scholarly oversights. In her introduction to a 2012 special issue of the Journal of World History, Gerritsen highlights some of these oversights. She notes, for example, that the Pilgrim Art, like many studies on the subject, tends to overemphasize the importance of surviving ceramics while neglecting to consider the extent to which these once formed part of much broader, varied, and ever-changing material worlds. <clears throat> 
She also notes that Binley repeats a narrative that begins with production in China and then leads to the universal acceptance of the alleged superiority of Chinese porcelain. And this implies a uniformly manifested desire which overlooks the various modes of consumption that arose within different contexts or the distinctions and nuances of appropriation. I'll touch briefly on these broader themes in a moment, but first I'd like to turn to one specific yet pivotal episode in this narrative, and that's the Chinese invention and global circulation of blue and white. Notice the color of these book covers. And I'd like to note the absence in the story of Southeast Asia, except as a fleeting presence. For an archetypal telling of this episode, we can turn again to Finley, and you can see that essentially it's about, it's about um, interaction between the Middle East and China, and it's this very almost one-way transmission from China to the world, which just leads to this universal appreciation. In the issue of the Journal of World History that I just noted, ceramics historian Stacy Pearson identifies Margaret Medley's 1976 text, The Chinese Potter, as well as a brief but effervescent article on Beloved Blue and White that Duncan McIntosh penned for a 1973 edition of the Hong Kong-based arts magazine Orientations as the primary sources for this narrative, which was later elaborated by John Carswell in Blue and White, Chinese Porcelain and its Impact on the Western World of 1985, on which Finley draws extensively throughout the Pilgrim Art. The popularity of this lineage, Pearson writes, can partly be attributed to the desire to create a grand narrative of what was far from a unified experience. In most regions that encountered Blue and White, there were different consumer groups within nations and cultures, different local responses and different patterns of consumption and appropriation. Southeast Asia was one such region, yet the diversity and complexity of responses to Chinese trade ceramics across this region have been under acknowledged by current scholarly paradigms. In the standard narrative, and I've got a few maps here just as a reference point, Southeast Asia figures at best as a staging post for Chinese, Muslim, Portuguese, Spanish, Dutch, and British merchants traversing the southern seas, or at worst, it becomes little more than an incidental passage between East and West. This is, of course, a worldview that has long shaped externally imposed frameworks for studying the history, politics, and cultural characteristics of this region, extending far beyond the relatively self-contained study of export ceramics. The late John David Legger, an authority on Indonesia's modern political history, who played a key role in shaping Asian studies in Australia during his long tenure at Monash University, traced the formation of this attitude in his introduction to the first volume of the Cambridge History of Southeast Asia. Before the Second World War, he explains, scholars of Southeast Asia outside the region showed, on one hand, an almost universal tendency to focus on its constituent parts rather than the region as a whole, emphasizing the potential nations of the future defined by the accidents of colonial rule and not what might be described as natural cultural entities cutting across artificially established political boundaries. On the other hand, he notes, due to disciplinary training in Indology and Sinology, these scholars tended to see Southeast Asia as shaped by influences external to the region, rather than by an internal dynamic, citing it variously as an appendage of India, China, or the West. In the aftermath of the war, the Second World War, and the subsequent rise of new visions of nation, as well as new geopolitical tensions, Lega argues, the basis of this way of looking at Southeast Asia was effectively destroyed, but he concedes that despite a growing disposition to see Southeast Asia as a region, much of the post-war work continued to be directed to individual countries. Arguably, the tendency to position these nations as little more than appendages of larger and more powerful neighbors has also endured, due less to a disciplinary bias perhaps and more to the nature of surviving textual records which are largely Chinese imperial and European colonial, as well as to the influence of global politics. Writing for a recent issue of World Art about the curatorial innovations introduced into last year's Singapore Biennale, David Tay draws attention to the persistence of this image of Southeast Asia as a region defined by more powerful geopolitical entities. In most of the region, he writes, regionalism is a recent policy rarely espoused with conviction, while those regional models that have gained visibility are largely instrumental and institutional in form, imposed by economic alliances 
like ASEAN, or emanating from within certain nation states like Singapore with expansive global ambitions. We can now speak of a regional scholarly community, but is there a regional epistemy? What case, if any, has been made for the region as an interpretive handle or as a basis for new knowledge? One of the most promising models proposed for such a regional epistemy, in my opinion, especially for maritime Southeast Asia, has been that of the ocean and the fluidity, exchange, and open communication that this watery world suggests. Barbara Watson and Dyer has been a leading advocate for this model. Using her tenure as president of the American Association for Asian Studies, back in 2045, I believe, to argue that the oceanic may enable us not merely to work with a larger canvas, but to capture something of the human encounters that underwrite the communication between areas and between people, opening new perspectives on the intertwined histories that should be integral to our projection of Asia. But the most appealing qualities of the oceanic, its inclusive flexibility and its expansive conceptual resonance are also potential limitations, risking a reduction of the complexity of the region. In their introduction to a special issue of Asian diasporic visual cultures and the Americas in 2017, Margot Machida, Thomas Lusa, and Francis Maravillas propose a focus on islands as localized points of connection and distinction, which productively complicate this oceanic model, conjuring visions of a constellation of multiple worlds circumnavigating the measureless depths. But in our search for a theoretical model that can anchor regional perspectives to local conditions, we could also look beneath the waves to the many ships that have fallen prey to unpredictable weather or hidden reefs and rocks in their voyages among these islands, coming to rest on the ocean floor with their cargoes and the remains of their crew. The recent discovery and salvage of two wrecks in Singaporean waters, tentatively dated to the 14th and 18th centuries, exemplifies the potential of sunken ships to transform our understanding of the historical eras in which they set sail. The first of these, which was located about 100 meters to the northwest of Pedro Branco, a rocky island at the eastern end of the Singapore Strait, came to light in 2015, when divers who were hired to clear the surrounding sea of scrap metal after the dynamiting of two cranes on a container barge that had run aground, found a submerged treasure trove of ceramics. By chance, one of these divers recognized a close similarity between the ceramics and those excavated from Empress Place around the same time, the significance of which had attracted extensive media coverage. Fortunately, the divers were civic-minded enough to hand their finds to the ISES, Yusuf Ishak Institute, which with the National Heritage Board launched an archeological survey of the site. Under the guidance of the renowned maritime archeologist, Michael Flecker, a second wreck was found and identified as the Shaman Cha, an East India Company vessel that sank in 1796 on its return from China to India, while the cargoes of both ships were recovered in a series of diving expeditions completed earlier this year. And these are just some of the things that were found in the 14th century ship. But the most intriguing aspect of these wrecks for me and for this talk, I think, is the discovery in what remains of the older vessel, the most substantial cargo of UN Dynasty blue and white trade ceramics ever found in Southeast Asian waters. The quality and the quantity of these pieces far exceeds earlier finds, while the similarity of Celadon glazed wares carried by the same ship with those unearthed at Empress Place indicates that at least part of the cargo was likely intended for local circulation. Flecker notes the vase on the right as an especially remarkable find, but other fragments and intact pieces are equally sophisticated in their decoration and equally refined in manufacture. They're a far cry from the coarse cast-offs that Finley imagined as the only Chinese ceramics available to the awestruck inhabitants of this undeveloped but resource-rich hinterland in his words. But rather than an indictment of Finley's scholarly acumen, such contradictions are instead a marker of the limited evidence on which current understandings of the market for porcelain outside China are based and so of the abrupt shifts that a new discovery can prompt. The so-called Sinan shipwreck, for example, which was discovered in 1974 in the constellation of islands that comprise South Korea's Sinan County, remains the standard point of reference for scholars who assert that blue and white ceramics were not produced in China until the 14th century. Despite a great deal of evidence to the contrary, subsequently discovered both in Chinese kiln sites 
as well as in other shipwrecks. With the publication of Macintosh's article and Medley's book, within a few years of this discovery, the Senan wreck should be acknowledged as a key source for the enduring narrative of blue and white. As Pearson explains, this wreck is often used as a benchmark for the production of blue and white, as none was found in its cargo. But it was, of course, but a single shipment from China to Japan, and thus represents a single order or, or a combination of orders that were shipped together for a single market. More recent excavations have proven that blue and white was made earlier, but this information is ignored or misunderstood because the evidence of the Sinan wreck supports the popular assumption that blue and white was produced for Arab markets in the 14th century. And what Pearson's comment clearly demonstrates is that salvaged cargoes have their limitations as a source for understanding the distant past. As isolated case studies for quantitative and material characteristics of trade at the historical moment of their demise, which scholars can then use as a basis for more general speculation. This limitation is at the same time an advantage of this category of archaeological remains, the analysis of which has evoked comparison for Derek Hung with that of microhistory in the, in the broader discipline of world history, whereby case studies of individuals and their activities may be extrapolated to arrive at macro level patterns of regional and global significance. Comparable traces cannot be found on land, where the continued occupation of a site, sometimes for centuries, can make it extremely difficult to discern exactly when any ceramics unearthed first arrived or when they were deposited. The relative ease with which these sites can be found and excavated in contrast to their watery counterparts, combined with the mobility of intact antique ceramics, has also meant that many of the most valuable finds have long since been returned into circulation by enterprising locals or acquisitive treasure hunters, neither of whom tend to keep extensive notes on provenance and disposition. It is perhaps for this reason that the role of Chinese ceramics for indigenous communities remains so central to our understanding of their use in Southeast Asia. Their burial with revered ancestors, the locations of whose grave sites are meticulously recorded and protected, has likely ensured preservation from extensive looting. So if we take the cargo of the 14th century Pedro Branca wreck as a micro history from which macro level patterns can be extrapolated without necessarily jumping to the sweeping conclusions for which the Sinan wreck has been cited as evidence, we can reasonably, I think, argue that the quality of blue and white carried by this vessel supports claims for a local market that at least equaled the cosmopolitan sophistication of the Islamic and European courts that have to date dominated our understanding of the China trade. In the absence of a surviving intact collection, we can really only guess at the extent and character of this market. But in Tay's estimation, this absence of surviving evidence need not be an insurmountable obstacle to our reconstruction of the past, even if this is speculative. We must reject this infantilizing logic, he writes, as if all our treasure must be unearthed and catalogued before it can be enjoyed, as if synthetic understanding is a supplement, the exclusive preserve of know-it-all specialists. The presumption of unreadiness is an affront to all the worldly reckonings this region has given us, a tourniquet on its intellectual history that would stifle its nimblest thinkers. So drawing inspiration from Tay's call for scholars to pursue myriad channels, myriad narratives, and myriad propositions about life and about society, as well as from the tactics of salvage inference and conjecture that Jara Sastrawan described in the first installment of this webinar series, I'd like to indulge in this final part of the talk in some speculation on the contexts in which blue and white ware may have been found, may have found meaning in the 14th and 15th centuries in the area of what is now Vietnam and Malaysia. We cannot know for certain how such objects were regarded and received, but we must consider them as more than just specimens within a typology of Chinese ceramic development, or as just export commodities that record a pivotal stage in the expansion of global commercial networks. I believe we should see them also as active materials for the formation of multiple forms of identity in their contexts of use and appreciation, even if these contexts can now only be partially reconstructed. Now, I've given a little chronology of the, uh, the, the eras that I'm talking about. So Dai Viet and what is now Northern Vietnam and Southern China was far removed from both the indigenous communities of the archipelago, which I started this, this uh, paper, as well as from the city of Temasek, 
which was a precursor for modern Singapore and which Flecker has identified as a possible market for the ceramics found in the Pedro Franca wreck. But it's besides, precisely because of this separation and because of the range of responses to Chinese blue and white to which it draws our attention that I believe it makes a good case to them. To understand how ceramics like these may have been received in 14th century Dai Viet, we should first reflect briefly on the long history of contact between this region and the expansive ambitions of Chinese imperial dynasties to the north. The first point of intersection for which we have textual evidence coincides roughly with the Han Dynasty in the third century BCE, when a general in the armies of China's self-designated first emperor, Qin Shi Huangdi, established the short-lived Troll Dynasty. The Han emperors regarded this southern state, which they termed Nanyue, as a threat to their authority, invading a little over a century later and incorporating it into their sphere of influence as the province of Jiaozhi. The late Vietnamese historian Tran Quoc Vong noted this occupation as the start of a thousand years of Chinese domination and anti-Chinese resistance, during which the Viet people were harnessed to the expansionist chariot of Chinese dynasties and so became expert in the art of surviving next door to the biggest empire on the globe. This millennium of Chinese suzerainty, waxing and waning with the rise and fall of the Northern dynasties, only came to an end with the collapse of the Tang dynasty in the 10th century, leaving a power vacuum that was filled by the militaristic Din and Lu, whose martial prowess and alliance with a politically astute Buddhist establishment enabled them to resist attempts to reimpose Chinese dominance. But recognizing their aptitude for war rather than statecraft, the Buddhist power brokers who had supported these clans later turned instead to another protege, Li Tong Wen, an orphan educated by monks who had gained some authority as commander of the palace guard and whose rise to the throne in 1010 inaugurated the Li dynasty, a succession of rulers who did much to define the cultural wellsprings of Vietnamese identity. By this time, Tran Quoc Vong argues, modeling after China had become a historic necessity and the rulers of Dai Viet had always to keep a watchful eye northward. This brought about a cultural dualism a dilemma between the national system of reference and the Chinese one, both during the reign of the Li emperors and that of their successors, the Tran. I realize I'm skipping over large parts of history here, limited time. So by the 14th century, when the earlier of the two vessels discovered off Pedro Branca came to rest on the ocean floor, the Vietnamese reception of blue and white wares comparable with those found in the salvaged cargo, like these at the British Museum, the provenance of which can't really be known now. The response to such wares would have been comparably mixed. On one hand, the Li and Tran emperors cultivated and endorsed many aspects of Chinese culture. Li Tongwen, for example, in typical Chinese imperial fashion, aspired to restore harmonious relationships between rulers and ruled, and between rulers and the supernatural powers. He criticized the Din and Le dynasties for ignoring the will of heaven and affirmed a golden age during the ancient Chinese Shang and Zhou dynasties as a political model for his rule. His grandson, Li Natun, adopted many of the formalities of China's imperial court, from the official name of the realm to the ranks and titles conferred upon ministers, members of the royal family, and his own royal ancestors. The first Tran emperor, proclaimed in 1225, instituted a Confucian-style examination system to recruit government officials for which aspiring candidates prepared themselves by studying the classics, histories, and literature of China. And this inevitably fostered the emergence of a small but articulate class of literati who cultivated an image of learning derived from their classical education. The furnishing of a scholarly studio in the appropriate style would have been a central concern for those privileged to join this elite set with imported works of art and ornaments, including ceramics, likely in high demand. Though we should bear in mind that a Taste for blue and white had not yet developed among the scholarly elite in China, who generally preferred the restraint of the monochrome over the ostentatious luxury of this new ceramic. So for those in Dai Viet, who sought instead to cultivate a sense of local distinction, such distaste among China's scholarly elite may have presented an opportunity to show their disregard for Confucian standards. Given the extent to which such wares were created at this time primarily for export, and given the market that they enjoyed elsewhere in Southeast Asia, Perhaps a proclivity for blue and white could be taken as an emblem of affinity with regional powers to the south, 
In purely material terms, it may also have served as a medium of exchange to foster and confirm such alliances, especially with the collapse of crown authority from the 1340s, with escalating civil unrest and a series of devastating natural disasters. In 1407, Recognizing the golden opportunity this presented for reviving Chinese authority, the Ming Yongle Emperor invaded and occupied Dai Viet, bringing a decisive end to the Li Tran era and inaugurating two decades of assimilation, during which the Dai Viet cultural patrimony was savagely drained. Here then, blue and white would not have been regarded as it was in the archipelago as a bankable cultural asset with which to reward followers, to cement alliances or to boost status and reputation but as a reminder of the threat of imperial absorption, as a sign of China's cultural and commercial power, and perhaps an opportunity for resistance through creative appropriation. And then if we move to the Malay Peninsula, where the regional ambitions of the Yongle Emperor had a very different outcome. So here at a safe remove from the threat of territorial expansion, imperial emissaries were welcomed as bearers of the emperor's support for Malacca. And they might have enjoyed pieces like this. While Ming forces carried out the destruction of cultural legacies in Dai Viet, a Malay ruler known as Parameswara, recorded as the last king of the Sumatran Thalassocracy of Srivijaya, fleeing the advance of the Majapahit Empire from neighboring Java, first sought refuge in Temasek, and then, finding this too exposed to attack from the Thai state of Ayutthaya, moved up the peninsula to found Malacca. In 1405, when the Muslim Chinese Admiral Zhang He needed a port from which to coordinate his awe-inspiring fleet of 317 ships, each carrying around 600 crew members and a substantial cargo of trade goods, including blue and white ceramics, Parameswara gladly offered to extend his hospitality in return for protection from Javanese and Thai rivals. We know that Zheng He and his crew were only the first of many travelers to enjoy the pleasures of this cosmopolitan entrepot at the entrance to the Strait of Malacca. We also know that Parameswara was one of the first rulers in Southeast Asia to convert to Islam. So here then we have returned to the conventional understanding of blue and white as a global commodity at the peak of its desirability during the Ming dynasty, which combined the technical sophistication of Chinese ceramic tradition with the mercantile entrepreneurialism and ornamental proclivity Okay, please bear with us. It seems our uh, speaker has frozen. Um, I know we've got lots of people in the audience keen to hear the rest of Alex's talk tonight. So we will see if we can get him back. Please bear with us and enjoy the beautiful picture on your screen while we're doing so. Thank you. Terrific, Alex. Welcome back. Don't worry, nobody's left. So um, oh, everyone is <laughs> keen to hear the, the, the remaining um, parts of your talk. And if you want to share your screen again, you left us I with some sorry. lovely blue and white. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was just we saying were, that... We were a bit before this. Uh, this one? Yep, perfect. Terrific. Thank you. And thanks, everybody, for your patience. Sorry about that, everyone. Um, the, the trials and tribulations of Zoom. So here then we have returned to the conventional understanding of blue and white porcelain as a global commodity at the peak of its desirability during the Ming dynasty, which combined the technical sophistication of Chinese ceramic tradition with the mercantile entrepreneurialism and ornamental proclivities of the Islamic world. But rather than West Asia, the usual port of call for scholars of this history, we find ourselves in what is now the most populous Muslim region in the world, for the reasons I mentioned earlier, that is the lack of surviving intact collections or undisturbed archeological evidence on land, 
We know little about the place that blue and white porcelain may have occupied in Malacca, but again, we can speculate. It seems reasonable to assume, for example, that the wealthier residents of the city shared the taste of their peers in Timurid, Persia, which was then the center of Islamic culture for this exotic commodity. If so, they may have regarded blue and white ceramics like their Iranian counterparts as treasured emblems of their wealth and status for use only on the most prestigious of occasions. To receive an honored guest, to celebrate a wedding, or to confirm an alliance with a lavish communal banquet. They may even have installed their collections in extravagant mass displays comparable with the Chinikane or China Room put together by Parameswara's close contemporary Uluk Beg at Samarkand in what is now Uzbekistan. A bespoke architectural setting that consisted of multiple shelves and niches installed on walls in which were placed ceramics for display. And John Guy spoke a little about the one that we see on the left at the Ardabil Shrine in Tehran. The style, which is when the style of ceramic display achieved its most ostentatious expression at the court of the Safavid dynasty. And these displays are believed to have at least partially inspired the better known porcelain rooms of 18th century Europe, which were the most profligate expressions of a taste for chinoiserie. So reflecting again on the title of this paper, while we cannot know for certain how blue and white ceramics were regarded and used across the region during the historical moment in which the first Pedro Branca wreck set sail, I think we can safely assume that the power and privilege of these wares were not recognized only by the indigenous communities of the archipelago. And we can dispense with the lingering belief that Southeast Asians only had access to the lower end of the market. The blue and white ceramics found in the Pedro Branca include some of extremely high quality, which would not have looked out of place in the courts of Europe and the Middle East in rooms like this. Against a prevailing emphasis on these courts and their commercial ties with China, the salvaged cargo draws attention to the pivotal role played by Southeast Asian merchants and consumers in the circulation of Chinese ceramics. In the absence of surviving examples or intact collections with a secure provenance, however, and in our efforts to reconstruct this role, we must take up Stacey Pearson's call to turn instead to the traces that these objects have left behind, literary and pictorial references Okay, uh, not again. It looks like um, Alex is frozen again. I'm really sorry about this. It seems um, the internet connectivity in our nation's capital is not great. We just lost you again there, Alex, but welcome back. <laughs> I'm hoping oh, you can hang in there until the Q&A session, because I'm sure there will be lots of questions. We just lost you for the last 30 seconds or so. I was I was um, commenting on John Guy's masterful research and his, yeah, the masterful <laughs> research he shared with us. As I was saying, it's a model for um, a model case study for this approach that Pearson summarizes, drawing on manuscript illustrations and literary evidence as well as archaeological finds to flesh out, flesh out our understanding of the place of Chinese ceramics in Sultanate and Mughal India. And it's only with recourse to such tactics of salvage, inference and conjecture, I believe, that we can hope to grasp the diversity and complexity of Southeast Asian responses to Chinese blue and white. Thanks, everyone. Hopefully I'm... Wonderful. Okay, we got there. We got there. <laughs> well done. Thank you, Alex. Um, we have um, we have lots of people in attendance, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions coming through on the q and I can see a few coming through already. Um, but Alex, I would like to thank you very much for sharing your research and for joining us um, in this Heritage and the Arts webinar series. Um, I really like how, I know that you're primarily a China scholar, but I really like how you've um, centred Southeast Asia in this story of blue and white, which, as you commented, does tend to be dominated by stories of China, as the place of production and the Middle East as the destination of these objects. Um, and you pointed out the central role of Southeast Asian merchants and traders. And it's um, you know, also, also worth pointing out that um, Southeast Asians played a key role as pilots and navigators of these, um, these ships that you're, you're, you're referring to, um, navigating the shoals and the reefs and um, you know, avoiding the shipwrecks um, that we rely on as our sources. <clears throat> 
Um, so one thing I just wanted to comment on was um, you showed a photo of the um, Asian Civilizations um, Tongue Shipwreck Collection, which is a really wonderful exhibition for those of you who've had the, um, the power and the privilege of visiting it in Singapore. Um, and this, this particular connect collection numbering about 60,000 objects, um, uh, well, 60,000 objects were recovered from the shipwreck and about 55,000 of these were Changsha balls um, from the kilns of Changsha, 9th century. So a bit earlier than the period you're talking about. But um, what I find really amazing and really interesting is that um, it's also worth, worth pointing out that the earliest examples of blue and white dating to the 9th century were found on this Tung shipwreck. And these remain the first and the only intact vessels of high-fired underglazed stoneware painted in cobalt, cobalt blue um, to be discovered and salvaged. So even though we might think of these really pedestrian chuncture balls, which I've heard described as, you know, mass-produced floating IKEA muesli balls, on the same shipwreck, we find these incredible blue and whites, three of them, and also these um, very fine um, porcelainous whitewares from Northern China and the Celadon um, from US, so these very fine ceramics as well. Um, but anyway, uh, I have a few questions, but I might jump into the chat. Um, so great to have everybody here. Um, I'm going to go to um, James Flexner first. James, thanks for joining us. So James's question is, how much do you think the lack of terrestrial archaeological evidence for porcelain use from this period is a result of the focus of scholars working in the regions you discuss on prehistory rather than more recent historical periods. Um, he's got a second question. He's also wondering what you think about the potential for a broader survey of the use of these kind of objects outside of urban centers and royal courts. Thanks, James. I would say, I mean, the, the focus on prehistory is definitely, is definitely um, a thing that exists. And also, especially in Malacca, there's, there's a certain reticence, I guess, or a certain division, and this happens in India as well, where people divide the, the pre-Islamic from the Islamic or the post-Islamic periods. And there's a certain difference in focus on, on those different eras in the histories of the regions, which I think definitely comes into play. And then when people start talking about Islamic culture, they, they tend to just leap straight to, to West Asia and to areas over there, rather than thinking about the more populous and more you know established Muslim and Islamic traditions that exist in Southeast Asia. I think in Vietnam, I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert in Vietnam by any means, I'm an expert in, in China, but I would say that they have such an established historical tradition and such an established understanding of their past that I would, I would think that archaeology there is, is very, um, and with the, with the French colonial programs as well, I would say the archaeology there is quite advanced probably in all historical and prehistorical periods, though you have episodes like the Ming occupation and, and other sort of periods throughout history when a lot of the, as John Guy mentioned last night in relation to India, a lot of the collections and evidence for these things was dispersed or destroyed or, or put back into circulation, I suppose. In terms of the potential for a broader survey of the use of these kinds of objects outside of urban centers and royal courts, I think that would be, that would be wonderful. I'd love to see more attention to things outside of the courts and outside of urban centers because there would have been, I mean, in the archipelago, for example, in Indonesia and in the Philippines, ceramics would travel from the coast up to the, the hinterlands and they would they would essentially circulate all around the place. One of the beauties of ceramics is that they're so mobile, they're so easy to transport, they're so kind of fragile, but they're also very durable. So they, they, they get around the place. So I think that would be fantastic. And of course, as archaeologists, I, I hate to say this, but I think archaeologists prefer it when the ceramic's broken so they can look at how look at the sherds and look at how they're being made. Um, I, I agree with you, James, that there is a lack of terrestrial archaeological evidence. And it's one of the frustrating things for scholars of that period between sort of the 7th and 13th century in Southeast Asia, that even though we think of the Surajayan Maritime Trading Empire as sort of a regional entrepot, there is, um, you know, there's been very limited um, archaeological, terrestrial archaeological evidence that there was an entrepot in um, Palembang or Jambi or around there. Um, okay, moving on. Um, we have uh, another question. Um, thanks, Alex. Fascinating. This is from Paul McGregor. Can you comment on whether the symbolic imagery on the porcelain was purely from China or whether it may have drawn on symbolism or originating in Southeast Asia? I mean, definitely it drew on symbolism originating in Southeast Asia. 
so many cross pollinations of influence between China and Southeast Asia and the borders between them are so porous that sometimes it's difficult to discern really where China ends or, or, or where Southeast Asia begins or vice versa. And, and, and I mean, the same circulation can be identified as has been noted so many times between China and Europe with things like the willow pattern where it goes one way and they adapt it over there and then it goes back and it's adapted again and sent back. The same thing happened with Southeast Asia. And you could also get into John Guy's area of specialty, which is uh, local ceramic production, the local Vietnamese ceramics, where Chinese motifs were adapted, new motifs were introduced, and it all kind of blends together. And it's, yeah, it's, it's so, so much interchange. Yeah, and it's not just about the use of the symbols either. It's also this um, sort of circular exchange taking place between um, many different parts of the world in terms of the raw materials, such as the cobalt, for example, um, being sent across to China and being experimented with and then being sent out for sort of consideration. Um, okay, some more questions. Um, Adrian Vickers has said, has said, thanks, very nice work. He's asked whether you've looked at the collection in the National Museum in Jakarta, which um, apparently provides some of the best evidence for your case, um, thinking also of how ceramics were set into Balinese temples. I have not, and I would love to. I tried to look up some of the collections online, and I mean, the, the, there, there wasn't as much available online as I'd hoped, and yeah, I mean, one day, hopefully, when we can travel again, I can yeah. get that collection. That's a call for um, digitization of <laughs> collections and information. Um, okay, um, I guess I, I would like to ask a question, um, which is to pick up on the idea of shipwrecks as sources, as archaeological and historical sources, and you mentioned the limitations of wrecks as such sources. Um, and if you were listening to John Guy talk last night, you would have heard Jackie Menzies, um, you know, reflecting that enthusiasm about um, the discovery of each new shipwreck, um, such as these two shipwrecks of Pedro Branco that you've been referring to. Um, but it also brought to my mind the Geldermalsen shipwreck from the 18th century, which was salvaged in the 1980s and um, sold by Christie's auction house in Europe for millions and millions of dollars. So. Um, and that was mostly blue and white. There was a lot of tea, of course, but that wasn't salvaged and sold. Um, but it really set a bounty on Chinese ceramics from Southeast Asian waters. So could you comment on, on that in terms of, uh, I'm interested in particular in terms of pro establishing provenance from shipwreck cargoes. That might be a, a tricky question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure, I don't have much experience in the area of establishing provenance from shipwreck cargoes, but I do know how important they've been to the scholarship of ceramics. Okay, yeah, sure. So I guess what I'm getting at is um, the different management approaches to shipwrecks and how um, how we can use them as sources, um, recognising that, as you said, you know, fishermen and um, looters perhaps might be selling the objects. So, you know, maybe we could reframe the question in terms of um, the presence of these objects in museum collections. Oh, yes. Yep, I mean, what was the, sorry, sorry, what was the question? Well, it, it, look, maybe it's not a question, it's more an observation really, that these are valuable historical and archaeological sources, but sometimes they are brought out of the border in ways that, you know, we might not know about. Oh, yeah. um, so establishing provenance in a museum collection is, of course, important, but sometimes um, that's a very difficult thing to do. Um, notwithstanding the fact that they are incredibly um, useful sources for um, not only archaeologists, but for art historians and, and other researchers. Okay, we've got um, some more questions, which I'll jump to now. Um, John Clark, thanks for a splendid talk with an admirable trans-regional historical grasp. Can you tell us what role Ayutthaya played in mediating Chinese ceramic flows to Persia, given that some elements of this exchange are recorded in Persian texts? Oh, afraid I can't, John. <laughs> <It's not laughs> That's a tricky question. I think I think Pavan is in the audience as well, so it might be a mm, um, yeah tricky one. More equipped to talk to that to me. It's really not my area of expertise. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Thank you. Um, okay. Now we have a question from um, Vietnam from Alex Kiang. Hi, Alex. 
Um, Alex says, there is likely very limited evidence of using blue and white ceramics in the, Viet in the Vietnam court in Tung Long by the 14th century. Do you have any further solid evidence regarding that? I do not. I do not. I mean, again, it's, it's this is more, um, I guess, the start of a research journey for me. So I haven't had a chance to explore all the avenues and pathways, but but it's something I very much like to explore and, and hopefully one day I can go and visit collections and, and explore some of these things. But at the moment, but at the moment, I'm kind of indulging in some speculation, I suppose, and some uh, some informed conjecture just to imagine perhaps some of the ways in which the ceramics may have appeared. But I would love to to try well, Alex, Alex has also kindly shared a link to a conference on imperial wares in Dai Viet um, in December. So um, when we're done, Alex, I'll invite you to jump in and click on that link so you can have a, a look and, and to others in the audience too, if you'd like to have a look at that link. Um, okay, I would like to come now to um, a couple of the remaining questions about the blue and white. Um, this one from Krishna, what was the reason for the use of blue on white? Was it cultural or practical? As in within China? Yeah, for, for the mean, production a, of these blue and whites, yeah. There's a long history. I mean, Natalie mentioned, you mentioned the, the very early finds on the Belitung shipwreck. Of those really early blue and whites but there is a there's a there's a massive kind of i guess prehistory of blue and white with other wares like zizhou ware and zizhou ware which similarly had painted decoration on on a white or or a kind of contrasting color underglaze um, yeah underglaze so it's blue and white in a sense and more and more scholars are doing uh, are linking it in this way to this longer history of, of painting on on um, a contrasting glaze but i guess the standard story is that China produced these wonderful white wares, which had this beautiful glaze that no one else could imitate. And then within um, Persia, Iran and Iraq and other places in the Islamic world of West Asia, they were using cobalt on glass and ceramics of their own. And they had this mastery of cobalt, which the Chinese allegedly just couldn't. Oh, Alex. And so then they came together in this beautiful communion and they discovered this fantastic flowering of, of creative energy is the the kind of standard no, back. narrative but i mean back sorry I, I, I dropped out again i saw but yeah they, that's the standard narrative but i mean cobalt was used as well in china for centuries as a monochrome glaze it was used on sun tai wares three color wares in the Tang dynasty in different kind of expressive ways so i would say that blue and white was really i mean it's both a, a combination of that internal history within china and that building up of, of influences as well as outside influences. So I'm not, you know, I don't doubt that the influence of Muslim merchants in Quanzhou or, you know, massive markets for these wares overseas, not only in West Asia, but also in Southeast Asia among Islamic um, courts who, who, who admired that kind of style. I'm not doubting that that also would have played an influence. So it's this, it's this confluence, I would say, of the two. And of course, they later found favor in, in Europe as well. Which helped. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, a question, one more. Um, uh, I may have missed this, but do we have any sources or exact idea about who was using these blue and white porcelains in Vietnam and um, the Malay Peninsula? Were they local or Muslim merchants? Again, I haven't discovered, I haven't come across that yet, but I will endeavour to find it out. I imagine they would have been because there were Muslim merchants in in Vietnam, they, they tended to get all over the place. So I imagine they would have used it, but I, I would also think that local Vietnamese people would as well, would be my guess. Okay, thank you. Um, and an, a question from Jara Sastra, one who you um, referenced earlier, and Jara was the first now speaker in our um, seminar series. Um, so Jara's question is, uh, thank you very much, Alex. I wonder if you could comment generally on the utility of pre-modern textual sources, whether Chinese or Southeast Asian or Middle Eastern, in testing or supporting art historical arguments. I suppose the, the tricky thing about pre-modern textual sources, as with all textual sources, is that they were written with quite specific purposes and aims and ideologies in mind. So the Chinese sources have been very rigorously and vigorously debated and unpicked in terms of the way they frame certain aspects of Southeast Asia as very much a part of expanding Chinese imperial global influence and tributary relations and the way in which it all becomes 
really a story about China more than it is a story about Southeast Asia. So I suppose in terms of thinking about, and the same is true, I'm sure of other sources, but in terms of thinking about the utility of using those as an art historical source, I imagine it would be very much about reading between the lines and following John Guy's approach and searching for, for those, those references to those, those odd references to things that you wouldn't normally find in those sources, I guess, and the illustrations and the things they show, I, I find that it's very much the things that generally aren't remarked on, which become the most remarkable because they're the things which are taken for granted and the things which perhaps don't attract historical records. So looking for those, those things between the lines where it mentions, you know, how a certain vessel was used or, or the number of certain ceramics which were presented as part of a tribute or what type of ceramics they were and then drawing from that inferences where you can. And yeah, a, re a reminder there with that question of the, the value and the importance of um, people with Chinese language facility studying texts of Southeast Asia. Um, really valuable. Um, we have um, one last question, um, an add-on to an earlier one, and I know that I'm testing your generosity here, Alex, because you've had lots of questions tonight, so lucky last. Um, adding to the previous question, we have records of Chinese merchants selling porcelains to Southeast Asians, but the large wares like the plates and wind bottles, uh, is that wine bottles perhaps? Um, were they sold to these areas by the Persian merchants? And if so, does this mean the Persians had settlements there? Yes, there were many Persian and Arab merchants and, you know, various Malay merchants, all sorts of different um, merchants from different cultures were, were, were traveling around and selling these, these wares. And, and as I'm sure Natalie would be able to say with much more authority than me, that the ships followed circuitous routes through the region and had many stop-offs along the way where they would sell a few wares and pick up a few others and stop for supplies and sometimes exchange crew. So, I mean, and there were settlements dotted all around because of course they had to follow the monsoon winds so they could only travel for six months of the year or they could only travel at a certain time of the year and then had to stay for six months. And I'm sure people would stay longer if they found, you know, a family or they, they found they liked the area. So in short, yes. <laughs> mm. Terrific. Okay, thank you. We have pushed your um, your generosity there, Alex, with all those questions um, across a wide range of areas, I have to say. And um, thank you to all of our um, audience members who um, uh, stuck with us throughout the occasional technical difficulty. Alex, it was a really wonderful presentation. We're so grateful to you for sharing your knowledge and, and your research with us here at the Sydney Southeast Asia Centre. Look forward to seeing where this project goes. Um, congrats on your book contract. Look forward to seeing that when it's out as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Natalie. And thank you, everyone who's, who's still here for listening. And I can see there's someone in the chat who's um, asked for your email address. Um, if you are interested in reaching out to Alex, you can um, find him on the University of Sydney website. So his contact details are there. Um, uh, just a reminder that um, we've got our final um, uh, webinar series coming up in a couple of weeks. Um, if you're in the Heritage and the Arts um, series, this might be a bit of a shift for you, but I encourage you to come along and learn about economic and social development in Southeast Asia. Our first speaker is Sandra Seno, Dr. Sandra Seno Alde, um, who's going to be speaking about the rich and the richer in ASEAN. So that should be super interesting as well. Please join us. Thank you for coming tonight. And Alex, once again, really appreciate your time. Thank you so much.